Thank you, report, Natalie John. Thanks, Mark. Um, I shall start and John will contribute um, as we go along if needed. Um, so again, I'll take the report as, as read, but I'll just guide through the main highlights for each of the sections. And as Janet described, each section was given a specific level of assurance, which is really helpful. Um, so the first area in the report is patient safety incident reporting. Um, so incident reporting remains within the expected variations. We've had no um, exceptions to that in the last um, reporting period. Um, the things to bring to board's attention is we gave it a level four. And the reason we did that was because we can see that um, actions are really clear. So we, we review our incidents and we agree actions and there's really good action plans. But what we can't see is those actions absolutely always being delivered and the resulting changes to patient outcomes made. Um, for example, the number of open actions when we look onto our system. I'm really confident that the new patient safety incident reporting framework will help us think very differently around that and will really focus on less small action plans, but much bigger focus on those big change items that will have an impact on, on patient care and patient outcomes. The only SI point to note again is we had a, a raise in SIs in August and again that was down to COVID outbreaks um, as it was previously in the year when we had another spike. Uh, mortality and learning from death reviews. Um, we've Previous had this externally reviewed, so we, we're confident in the process and systems we have. We scored at a level six. Um, actions are really clear. The learning shared between teams. There is some improvements we could make around, again, the sharing and the clear outcomes it impacts or it has on other patients. And, and that's a minor tweak, but otherwise it's a really, really robust process. Um, research and development, there's some highlights in the report around work being um, done, some great work when they buddied up with the um, mobile vaccination, um, getting some in evidence around people's perspectives of vaccines, which will really help with health, health research and health benefits. We rated that a five, again, really good actions, but it's the, it's the same question of moving into outcomes and, and the so what question as to what impact that has. Moving through to the dig digital clinical assurance group. Um, again, nice summary of the work being undertaken there. They are hampered at the moment with the outage of the care notes um, and many of the actions they have planned aren't possible without care notes being available. So many of those are currently on pause, which is why we gave it a, an assurance level of four. And finally, the last part of the report is around the CQC and the Hillcrest um, improvement plan. That had our lowest level of assurance. Um, we have some good understanding of the systemic issues. Why we have the current concerns that we do. We've had risk summit and action plans have resulted from that. It is really complex. Um, so we're confident that the action plan is being robustly developed um, and we're monitoring its process, but it is in its early stages um, and we're not yet seeing any impact of those actions or benefit to patient outcomes yet. So that's why we gave it the rating. That's the quality report. Thank you. Is there anything to add from you, John? No. No, nothing to add for me. Thank you, Chair. Does anybody have any questions at all? I have one. OK, um, it may not be colour coded, Natalie, John, but what it does have is time frames for when the improvements in the assurance levels will move, which I was uh, which I was pleased to see. And I think that's a useful thing to have in the report. So, yes, we are where we are now. And this is the time frame of when we believe we are going to improve. So so thank you for that. That was that was, a, I think, a learning for elsewhere as well. The one question I had was around inpatient mortality. Um, and I can't see from any of our reports how we how we fit in against uh, fellow trusts in that I can see where our average is. I can see our 
if we're between our lines, but I can't see how we compare to other trusts. So I, I have nothing of relativity to tell me whether our inpatient mortality is as it should be, unfortunately, or whether it, you know, we're a, an outlier at all. Is, is there any way that we can do that, John? I suspect I'm looking at John because... Um, yes. Um, we are not provided directly with benchmarking information on uh, mortality between trusts, even between similar trusts. And I think that was part of a conscious um, direction of travel when the initial mortality review process was introduced by the National Quality Board, in that we have a system of um, reviewing debts and learning from debts rather than um, looking at benchmarking with other, other trusts and uh, further exploring into that. Uh, I know this question has been raised before in the past, and I had raised it with the regional um, mortality um, uh, lead as well, but I don't think we are presented with benchmarking information, but I can go back, um, Chair, to, to review that, especially uh, now that the medical examiner um, posts are in place and we are having a more system-wide approach to learning from debts. Um, th thank you, John. The reason I did ask is, and I, I think it's probably me that's raised it before, um, is that when I was in the acute trust, it absolutely was provided and it became a driver for improvement because Worcestershire Acute at that time was an outlier. And so some it, had, it, it, it drove some pretty serious improvement based upon that because they could see they're an outlier in comparison to other like trust. That's the only reason I ask I, I ask the question, Don. If it's not provided, it's not provided. But I do wonder why they believe there's a difference between what inpatient community hospital mortality benchmarking is different to inpatient mm. mortality in acute trusts. Um, be, that, I think that's probably the question to ask is why the difference. That's Absolutely, and I suppose uh, the whole Mid Staffordshire uh, as well um, was highlighted through acute data on mortality. Um, it, it isn't presented that way for community and mental health trust because it's a quite a separate, different process that we were asked to develop uh, and which followed on from the acute trust. Uh, but I will um, uh, go back and check whether there's any information, especially from the Royal College perspective around mental health as well, and get back to the board. Thank you very much, John. Uh, do we ex accept those assurance levels in that report and note that report? Yes, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we move to Elaine, Workforce. Thank you. OK, thank you, Mark. Um, two parts to this. I'll start with um, attraction and retention. Uh, we're continuing to work on the um, on-the-spot recruitment events uh, with um, different levels of success. Uh, we had some success around CAMS roles, uh, some administrative roles, which we're hoping to repeat. Uh, we're also looking at firming up the matrix um, around uh, how we track vacancies and impact of the events that we, we actually um, do. Um, there is some additional work to be done on that, and we're doing this in collaboration with our service development leads. On the attraction front at an ICS level, we have delivered a, a draft workforce plan, but we're also going to be including in that the uh, mental health workforce planning as well, as with a focus on attraction as well as uh, retention. We're also looking at apprenticeship plans, uh, looking ahead uh, further down the road. Currently, we have around 170 apprentices, but we need to do some more deep dive work with our SDU leads to identify a longer term pipeline for staff. On the uh, workforce front, in terms of bringing our people's strategy to life, we've recently launched our senior leadership program. So that's for our immediate direct reports of uh, uh, execs over the next 12 months. That will be running uh, bi-monthly. It's part of our leadership recess and strengthening the relationship between execs and um, our senior leaders. We've also had the opportunity to offer some places to 10, 10 individuals within our wider, ECF, wider ICS, I should say. So that is underpinned by our uh, recently developed leadership qualities tool, which talks about our leadership from four sections, leading self, leading others, leading a service. And additional to that, 
in supporting our teams and e driving effective team working, the use of our TED team tool, so team engagement uh, development tool. That is linked to reconnecting our teams as well. Uh, we're also relaunching our uh, one to one, uh, my appraisal approach, given some of the statistics we've seen around uh, a decrease in the completion of appraisals, we're going to be working with those line managers where there are some challenges in exploring the potential to use, for example, uh, team objectives, uh, where there are large spans of control. In increasing engagement, because we know that we've had a lot of feedback about that, we previously brought a proposal which was about the uh, 580 Club. We're now renamed, it's a working title called the People Partnership Forum. This is providing a, a space where we can get direct feedback, where we take data from the um, quarterly survey and our national survey, and we're feeding back and feeding up and feeding down initiatives that we want to take forward, but taking feedback from our staff about what it is, what it's like for them and what we can do in collaboration with them to improve morale, in, improve engagement, the impact that it can have on retention, the impact that it can have on attracting our staff and general workforce uh, morale and engagement. On the freedom to speak up, Priest, that, that uh, Tessa mentioned earlier, Naraya and I have had about two or three of these sessions already. We, uh, I think there is an issue around resourcing it, which we do need to, to bottom out. And I've had a number of conversations with Nirai about that and how we might do that logistically. But we're, we're having, a, we've got about three more. We've been to uh, Hereford, we're going to Hillcrest, we're going to Holt, we're going to Evesham, etc. They're taking a number of forms. Uh, we're using technology where we can, i.e. Mentimeter. Uh, we're doing face-to-face -face conversations. We're doing those deep dives. What we're beginning to get is a sense of the degree or ease with which our colleagues feel that they can speak up is also very much about the culture in which they work, as well as the strength of the relationship with their line managers. So we've already seen that as an initial outcome. And we'll probably see that as a theme as we continue to do these, these sessions. So I'll um, stop there, but happy to take any questions, if anyone has any. Do we have any questions at all on that? Thank you, Elaine. Jamie. <clears throat> Thanks, Elaine. It's good to see the scale of activity that's happening around uh, recruitment and retention. And as you say, it's uh, I'm, I'm glad you're looking at ways in which you can monitor that. Uh, and I suppose that's particularly important given the the worrying turnover uh, chart that's shown in the in the in the report. This may sound a bit simplistic, but it always seems to me that if you measure something at a point in time, uh, that, that only gives a limited um, a limited view of what you're trying to capture. And actually, if you think about the recruitment and retention as a as a process. We will enter a period, say a month, with an opening balance of vacancies that that those number of vacancies will increase during the month with uh, with departures and e exits. And it will. The numbers will go down with the number of uh, new hires. Is there not some way in which we could just have a very high level, simple metric that shows shows that so we can see where we started within a period and how many people we've hired and, and what the closing balance is. Yeah, that's that's actually one of the, I, I don't think it's included in this paper, that is the metrics that we've already started to work with. What we need to do is to drill down in yeah. that. We're trying to keep it simple, Jamie. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, and Tessa, now tell you about dashboards, I suspect. <laughs> Oh dear, you, you can read my mind, which is very worrying, Chair. <laughs> um, I think that's that's key to it. The dashboard that needs to be developed for the Workforce Committee should give us some of those fairly straightforward metrics. I know collecting the metrics isn't always straightforward, but mm. those key indicators that show us. And I think the other thing um, that we're going to need is the timeline, because all of yeah. the work that's being done, and Elaine's outlined very clearly all of the work that's being done, it's huge. And it should be because we've got one of the biggest risks 
um, in the organisation to deal with. But actually, it's working out the timelines for delivery, a bit like Matthew spoke to us previously about um, the IAP changes and the fact that there's all this work being done. But because of the lag in data, we might not see the outcome for I think it was nine months, if memory serves me correctly. And that's the sort of information I think we need at workforce committee and then for board to say actually this is all happening but we we're not likely to see the significant changes or there's going no. to be step changes like the um the time to recruit metrics which has gone from 80 to 76 but we're heading for 50 what's mm-hmm. the timeline on doing that so i do think jamie's point about having some of these simple um indicators of how many people have left how many people have started but also having a timeline um around how long do we think it's going to be before we see a significant improvement in the ratio of less leavers and more starters. Yeah, yeah. and the, the people dashboard will will provide some of that. I think the, the caveat I would always put on that, there are some things will change uh, literally overnight and there are some things which we'll see um, positively or less so, but, but it will hopefully capture that as a moving feat. John? Um. Uh, always these reports <clears throat> would usually contain information about uh, disciplinary and investigations related to medical staff. It's not very clear, Elaine, uh, from page 138 and 137, whether it actually includes includes that. Or whether it's subsumed within the SDUs. It, it may well be subsumed within the SDUs. However, I would need to check, John. I don't want to say absolutely yes here, but I will check. Thank you. Thanks, John. Just a couple of comments, if I may, Elaine, uh, to give you uh, congratulations on the on the move on apprentices. I think the more we go down this route, it's clear an expanding route across the nation. And I was so impressed in talking to some of our staff at the staff awards that apprentices apprenticeships had given members of staff a new and perhaps their only opportunity to develop in their current role into the next role which was previously closed to them so it was uh, uh, to give you th- thorough support and, and and thank you for pushing that and your team pushing apprenticeships it's great the other thing you mentioned appraisals and i did have a question about that because even though our appraisal rates i think is about 86 some, percent yeah. somewhere around there mm-hmm. um, um. It, it's it's a fundamental sort of fundamental tenet of our HR processes that everybody gets that one to one once a year. So I was pleased to hear you say we're now pushing that my appraisal. Which uh, so so thank you for doing that. The only other thing I was going to mention, which it, it's on your report, but it could be on any report, is the use of rolling data. You use rolling turnover rate, which is fine, but whenever mm-hmm. we use rolling data, it can mask variances which may take actions uh, where may need where we may need to take action so it's useful to have rolling data but it's just for all of us to be aware that that it can mask some individual month on month changes that may need to have some action so wherever we use rolling data can we just have one eye on actually what's happening month to month as well as the rolling figures as well please and i suspect fits you know largely into robert's performance domain as well but so it, mm. it's just a general comment OK, thank you. Uh, and if there's nothing else there, if we, if we note that report, please, and then move on to Robert, you've got two reports. If you want to deal with your performance report on the dashboard first, please. Are we doing the safe staffing one, Mark? <laughs> and that'll be directly after the one I've missed. Uh, yes, yeah, so, sorry, Natalie. How can, I, how can I forget? You tucked away in the bottom left hand side of my screen, but uh, I missed it on the agenda. My apologies. Yes, safe for staffing. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Rob. It's because I'm so quiet and shy, Mark. It's easily done. Um, thank you. So, this is the six monthly staffing um, report, and you'll have also seen there is the bi monthly workforce staffing data within the workforce report as well. So I'll combine both. The bi-monthly data to remind people is the fill rates and the impact of vacancies and looking at the red flags. Um, And then the the six month staffing is the much broader looking at using professional judgment, any tools that we have to establish whether our our baselines are effective or changes need to be made. Um, The important things to flag to people's attention is that um, 
we continue to have high vacancy rates across community hospital wards um, for registered nurses in three particular wards, which is Cottage, Pertshaw and Malvern um, and healthcare support workers across six of the wards. In mental health, all of our acute inpatient wards have higher than 15% vacancy rates for RMNs. Um, and we have Hadley, Hillcrest and Holt, which also has the same higher rate of vacancies for healthcare assistance. We look at the impact of that in the safer staffing report, and we also look at other metrics such as skills and knowledge, other quality metrics and estates matters. So consistently in the report, um, people talk about high levels of acuity. So if we look at our use of bank and agency, which is high in various areas, for both community hospitals and mental health staff are reporting that patient acuity feels higher. So for community hospitals, they've seen a different patient group, higher levels of um, challenging behaviours related to dementia, a different population than they're used to. And in mental health, it's a, a higher level of mental health acuity. So that leads us to some of the recommendations around that it's not just about staffing numbers, but it's about the skills that staff have to deliver the, the care they need to with a different population of staff. Um, so that's some of the recommendations about training or a different workforce. The quality metrics. Um, indicate that the red flags for community hospitals that have been triggered over the last six months relate to slips, trips and falls. So these are the measures that are automatically noted if staffing level appears to be impacting on quality. And that's across six of our wards. It doesn't clearly correlate, though, with the highest levels of bank and agency or vacancy rates. It's more likely to be relating to patient um, population and physical environment. And for mental health, the only red flags that are triggered were around prone restraints. And a, just a reminder that any prone restraint triggers a red flag um, as it's something that we monitor so carefully. And that was across just the three for the last two months in Hadley and Jenny Lind, both have appropriately been um, quality assured. We also look at the environment and the place inspections have recommenced. And just to note again that safer staffing is challenged across a, a variety of settings due to estates um, and, and ward layout and design. So Hillcrest is an example in mental health where the layout of the ward makes safer staffing more challenging. And Izod is an example in community hospitals. Some really positive feedback though around some outdoor space, the meadow. Green project and the Princess Gardens project. Um, staffing are really talking very positively about those areas are being really well utilised. Benefits to staffing levels um, have been noted about how they're observed and used by patients, which is great. So I, I think in, in summary, um, it remains very challenging. The numbers we're able to achieve, the vast majority of our fill rate, so we, we use have more staff often than we have for a baseline establishment for a ward, but you'll see there's high levels of bank and agency in that, um, which is it just need we closely monitor it and obviously we are worried about some of the long-term consequences, but as you're aware from Elaine's report, the mitigations around the attraction and retention pieces of work we're doing to stabilise the workforce. Uh, Tessa. Thank you, Natalie. This is something that's just popped into my head and I didn't, didn't bring it up at either Quality and Safety or Workforce Committee when we looked at safe staffing. Um, during COVID times when visiting was restricted, um, obviously you, you hadn't got those extra pairs of eyes as in visitors watching patients and the acuity of patients and the slips, trips and falls and having to have additional staff to um, to um, observe the patients. Has any of that, um, and I remember sort of as we were coming out of COVID and, and visiting restrictions were being lifted, uh, certainly when I went out to a visit at Tenbury, they were saying, but 
visitors are still very reluctant to come in. Um, I just wondered where we're at with that, because visitors being with patients and therefore being able to monitor them while staff have a respite from it and are able to do other things. Has any of that gone back to pre-COVID levels or are we still struggling with less people visiting and therefore less, if you like, carer support while nurses and, and healthcare workers do their other jobs? Thanks, Tessa. And I think it varies. So we've um, seen a almost return to pre-COVID in some areas. Um, older adult mental health wards are a good example where visiting they feel is, is pretty much back to where it was pre-COVID. Um, but we still are definitely seeing a reluctance. So we're not having the same level of visiting as historically would have happened. There's also some reflection around the balance of visiting is really good, but also having visitors there for, for long periods of time can also be a challenge to patients engaging in the therapy that they require to fulfil their recovery and be discharged in a really effective time period. So it's trying to find that balance. And that's the position that most wards are currently in. Um, so not restricting visitors, but trying to find a, a better balance. Thank you. If there's nobody else, I've got a couple of points I was going to make, if I may, Natalie. One is admin. Um, the beginning of the paper suggests level two. The end of the paper suggests level three. Oh, that's um, my error. We, we so just, yeah, so we, we we started at a three, but actually with the conversations at quality and safety and workforce, we agreed actually it's coming out at a level two. So that's my error of not adjusting the end okay. of the report. Yeah, no problem. Uh, the, other, the other thing was, obviously, when I when I read... There's nothing more important to us than the safety of our patients and staff, is there? That's, that is a sort of a number one thing. And when I read this report, which is absolutely no criticism of anybody, that we can't give full assurance on safety on wards, that obviously rings alarm bells in my head immediately. So it strikes me that we need to, as a board, we need to keep sighted on this. Um, so although this is a six monthly report, I think board should receive at its next meeting and subsequent meetings something to tell us how this is going you've, you've indicated three three areas or three or four areas of action that should hopefully help because i do appreciate although safe and unsafe are two absolute terms where you know there, there are degrees aren't they you know no war you know no nurses no ncahas on a ward completely unsafe obviously but there's graduations isn't there and so there's some reality around the word safe and unsafe as well isn't there and I, I i think i'd like to board to receive some assurance sorry some reassurance around this as we move forward please uh, because of this the, the priority nature if that's okay absolutely so um it is our i i sense our one of our most challenging scenarios we have and we can't have full assurance at this point that our wards are always safely staffed what we do by the bi-monthly report and the six monthly is we look at how they're being staffed and then what appears to be the quality impact at the moment. That's the use of the red flags. It doesn't pick up things like patient experience and, and other softer measures. Um, what's really important is that we start to track that with our new plan for quality to underpin the clinical strategy. So we start to build a much more rounded picture of those experiences and what patient safety and quality means but that also as you said the actions from this report are the triangulation of the data that will then come back to quality and safety and workforce next month and board then the following around we need to fill these gaps in a very different way so that we're able to give fuller assurance and the continued sustained use of high levels of bank and agency needs to be changed okay and, and i I think you've just probably answered the questions that Tessa was coming up, up through work, workforce, whether it's part of the workforce report, whatever it might be. I think we do need to keep sighted on on the, the, where we are on this this piece of work because it's really critical to us, isn't it? OK, if there's nothing else on, on that at all, we'll move on finally to uh, uh, we, we'll get there to Rob. A couple of reports. First, the performance report followed by finance. Rob. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, so, yes performance report first of all and um, <clears throat> I, I, I think what I first will start with I'm, I'm good focus on the exact summary but there's a few bits just to draw out um, 
I think helpfully we we are seeing if you when you work through the exec summary, there's quite a cross reference to things that have been picked up through the meeting so far, which which um, I, th I think is a good reinforcement of, of where we're going. Um, I would just say now I, I I noticed from reading the exec summary, I haven't actually put in a summary around the system. We've gone straight to the um, the trust part, so we will include a, a very short summary on the the key uh, issues arriving from the system, but. Um, referring really here particularly to to urgent care and some of the other metrics but um, Sarah covered quite a lot of that in her chief exec's report so we we remain in a very pressured system um, in terms of the the, the key points from um, section three of the report which is around uh, the trust performance again we've split it into the themes and we have um, assigned assurance levels which we've uh, discussed at Finance Performance Committee. So um, you'll recall from last time that there's more developed metrics within the um, theme one, the quality of care domain. And um, as, a, as a good cross-reference, um, key metrics that are there in terms of the oversight framework are around IAPT, they are around inappropriate out of area placements. And um, Matthew's already um, talked to the former and um, the latter has been mentioned. I think Jamie picked up around uh, where we are with that. So I think quite a good read over. Pr probably the part I wanted to draw out was when you look at theme five, which is around the, the people metrics. Um, we, we have a couple of recovery plans that are in uh, gestation or one that's that's being worked up, which Tessa I think is due at um, Workforce Committee shortly. Um, we we should also be looking at the uh, the metric around um, staff with declared disability, and I think that might tie in with um, Sammy returning from maternity leave. But that that's another area. I was going to flag as well. We had some discussion last time about the um, the metrics that have no declared. Uh, KPI level at the moment um, and are effectively in for monitoring. We, we do have a key metric there, which is around staff sickness rate. And whilst there's quite a good explanation of what we're doing uh, within the Lane's report, um, our performance management framework would suggest we should be putting that into a formal recovery plan, which would go through workforce. So I, I think, Tessa, reading how you work through what you're doing that sort of, but we probably just need to formalise that one. Um, though those are the key domains I wanted to draw out on the performance report, Mark. Oh, and Jamie, just um, I did put in the chat on the integrated dashboard. We do have a summary metric on the the net starters leavers position, which I think is where Elaine's aiming to go with more granular detail by staff group, et cetera, et cetera. But um, it was just to say, I think that was the the kind of thing that you were. Um, looking at, and I know that certain discussions we've had through PMB around actually with all the work we're doing, is it getting better each month uh, as a you know a, a granular number? So, Mark, if that's okay, I will pause there and happy to pick up questions before moving on. Certainly, any any questions for anybody there? No, I, I think the style and the improvement in the reports is is demonstrating the heavy lifting that we're having done in in the subcommittees actually. Which is, which is useful. So no questions, Rob, so uh, move on, please. Right, thank you. And then moving on to the, the finance report then. Um, again, there's, there's been a lot of work going on in the, the finance sphere, as uh, those of you f &P will be aware and others from picking up the reports. But just in terms of where we are, um, I just need to contextualise. There is a a very detailed national assurance process that's been undertaken at the moment, um, so-called month six deep dives with with all systems to um, to provide some assurance around whether um, forecast and plans are, are lined up. There's been a, an enhanced level of escalation for all deficit systems, of which you'll be aware we are one of those. And we, we did have a meeting with regional and national colleagues on Thursday of last week uh, to go through that. Um, we'll, we'll obviously update in terms of where we are. Uh, Mark, I think you picked up there's an awful lot of risk both for next year, but, but clearly in this year. Just in terms of our position then, um, the revenue plan remains incredibly tight um, for us to achieve our plan for this year, but we are still forecasting to get there at the moment. Um, the 
position is is largely balanced of significant overspends on um, temporary staffing, offset by vacancies and other non-recurrent mitigations that, that we have in place. Um, I'm still expecting us to achieve our plan for the year, although it is very challenging. Rob, the uh, yes. Rob, at that stage, could I ask you to say a little bit more about that? There have been some conversations amongst uh, two or three non-executive directors about how we still manage to hit our target at the end of the year, yet have such a, an apparent uh, deficit in where we believe we're going to be with agency spend. You've touched upon it briefly there, but could you just explain a little bit more about how we can how we can be spending so much more on agency yet still be able to deliver the anticipated surplus, please? Yeah. Um, essentially, the, there's um, there's probably three factors in there. So there is um, unspent against our um, funded establishment where we have vacancies. Um, we have quite significant slippage on some developments that we have coming in. Um, Matthew would be able to explain we are doing things to mitigate that. We are investing in some temporary capacity and things like IAPT, and we're talking around um, community mental health transformation, things like that. But, but there is slippage on that, which is a one-off in your benefit. We have very good uh, cost control, you probably expect me to say that, but we are being very careful about how we do things. And then the, the third area which will be available to us this year, which we are using, um, is we had a number of um, appropriate uh, uh, provisions uh, in for last year, particularly coming out of COVID around uh, staffing costs and the like, which um, are unwinding this year and give us some some benefits in terms of how we are um, performing this year. So all non-recurrent in nature, but it's really across those areas that, that we are managing to balance things. Mark, does that help? So, yeah, it, it certainly does. And it reinforces, I suppose, that if certainly two, two of those big chunks are non-recurrent, so when we get to next year, they're not there in Absolutely. your our gift to balance the book. So it's it's not only about this year getting a grip of this, it's about subsequent years as well. Otherwise, we're going to be awry, aren't we? We, we are, absolutely. Thank you. Um, just to draw out the other bits, um, I mean, um, in terms of efficiencies, we have performed well as a trust this year. Um, a lot of trusts are struggling. Uh, our system is actually struggling on efficiencies, but, um, you know, congratulations to corporate teams and Matthew's frontline teams in particular for delivering um, efficiencies we set out. You recall we did quite a large amount of that as kind of some, um, some uh, uh, non frontline facing elements and we are confident we're going to deliver those so that that's been helpful we've touched on agency which is clearly um driving significant pressure and the key issue i keep saying is as you've just re reiterated mark is the impact for next year um liquidity remains good we have um a healthy bank uh cash balance uh which which is is um, very helpful and as I always say we continue to pay our way with our um, local and national suppliers and I'm you know, pleased to say we, we meet the BPPC which we have done every month for the last eight years. Um, the one I wanted to draw out was capital and we do have uh, two elements there so I will call it the business as usual so the internal plan um, which involves some quite big work, um, the Redditch solution, uh, a lot on David's areas around digital, that's all uh, following through on plan. We have, uh, though we do have an, uh, an issue emerging, so this is moving from a risk into an issue which is around the dormitories. This isn't the overall um, cost of the scheme, that this is around the cash flow, profiling and the national drawdown. We, we are at the moment just working through with our supplier, particularly around Stonebow, around what the latest cash flow is, but we are seeing a significant pressure in terms of cash that would be spent this year against the drawdown for the national funding, uh, which would cause us a problem for next year. So this is something I'll need to update um, committee and board in more detail in due course, but at the moment we are seeing a um, an emerging issue which which, which could have um, potential impacts on our capital programme for next year. 
I will pause there, Mark. Thank you, Robert. Uh, any questions, points of clarification at all? No? OK, thank you, Robert. Um, I know I say it all the time, but th this type of report and the obvious grip which you, the executives, and indeed all the teams across the Trust have got, stand us in the current context of the NHS, reasonably good stead. This is not seen everywhere in the NHS, uh, but it is seen within our trust. And it's uh, it's to Rob your and your team, and indeed Sarah, the across the trust's credit, that we have these controls in place. And there's a culture of trying to maintain effective, efficient budget management, because as, as I say, it's not seen everywhere. So so thank you for, for that. It's It's comforting to say the very least. Uh, OK, then, if we could now note that report, thank you, and move to Matthew's operational update to remind colleagues this is a new, so I think it's the second time we've received this report, gives Matthew an opportunity to keep board abreast of the bigger picture uh, operational uh, imperatives or operational uh, pressures within our system and within our trust. Matthew. OK, thank you. And the report this month um, produced by the associate directors. So I'll draw your attention to the following points. Um, our Children and Young People's Transformation Programme, just a reminder, that we initiated this in response to changing patterns in demand uh, beyond which traditional service models could uh, continue to support. Um, just to say some elements in Worcestershire, so ADHD, which we've heard about before, and educational health and care plans, which are a statutory function, the demand now is over twice the design service level. So it's a profound transformation, focus on productivity, process improvement, and a proportional focus on the children and young people with the highest needs. Um, we're in phase one of the four phase project at the moment, um, which is around information gathering, really understanding the potential for improvement. Some challenges with care notes on availability because um, it means that the data around productivity and activity <clears throat> is less available. And um, nevertheless, we, um, at the moment, we're, we're still planning to enter phase two in January and with a catch up on some of those elements in the new year. And in phase two, we're piloting our new approaches in some services. Not to say that some improvements haven't already been made. So <clears throat> things like um, paediatric clinic administration and the focus of paediatricians have already received attention and we're starting to see some benefits in those areas. Um, neighbourhood mental health teams, um, challenging recruitment in the phase two teams, that's in the east of Worcestershire. Managing that well at the moment with caseload stratification, um, so dividing those caseloads into um, higher, medium and lower levels of need and focusing uh, proportionately on those. Um, we're working as a system with uh, VCSE collaboration at the moment with partners um, seeking a proposal which we've received now for a temporary extension to VCSE services to support neighbouring mental health teams and for people with mental health need that doesn't need registered professional intervention. So we'll be considering that proposal in due course with a view to that continuing through to quarter three of next year. Um, I have services um, where the transformation programme as noted is delivering uh, strong results. Um, October um, in particular, we've got in month recovery now of the six and 18 week targets. Those are now meeting national levels. But there's a seven to nine month play through of that coming through to the KPIs, which are collected on patient discharge. Um, discussions will be required through Mental Health Collaborative Committee around system investment into IAPT. We've now reviewed the latent capacity of the service and we've revealed that we would require over 70 additional staff to be funded to meet the system access target. So, you know, some discussions to come around that. Um, Sarah has drawn your attention and we've discussed urgent care pressures in our response. Um, I'll draw your attention to the good work of the Minor Injuries Unit at Pouch, which is continuing its piloting of extended hours. So this is work that's diverting most immediately from the Alex ED. Um, it's our busiest MIU, so the best place to focus an extended um, hours pilot. We've also continued to increase our 
um, urgent care to our response. Um, uh, 40 patients a day now are benefiting from admission prevention and receiving rapid care at home, whereas previously, you know, these are patients who would be at serious risk of hospital admission. And we're also ma maintaining our response targets as well, despite the um, increased level of demand. And the service now incorporates an uninjured falls response. So instead of an ambulance, somebody who's fallen, they haven't got an injury that requires paramedic intervention, they can actually receive a response now at home. And we've got devices to help uh, re-establish the person into an upright position. I'm sure that's not the medical technical term, but that's what it is. Um, also of note, 9% of our referrals now are direct from um, WMAS, which is a very, very strong national benchmark. So, you know, the aspiration is 5%. We're exceeding that by almost double now. Um, just to note, not in the report, but um, needs mentioning before, um, certainly next board, we are involved in um, Operation Arctic Willow, which is a nationwide um, requirement of all systems to engage in pre-testing and their resilience prior to winter. So various events are taking place next week. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, I've got Jamie and then Martin. Thanks, Matthew. Um, it seems all my questions this morning are about Herefordshire. Um, I wanted to ask about urgent care and a very useful update about the Worcestershire system and our engagement. Obviously, since we're not the community services provider in Herefordshire, the nature of our interface with the acute in that county is going to be very different. But I was interested to see in a recent report, I think to finance and performance, that the uh, the performance and metrics of Y Valley Trust on things like ambulance handovers and uh, flow were worse than Worcestershire. So whilst it's not, we're not necessarily central to that debate, um, is that receiving the same focus and attention from within the ICB and indeed um, externally from from NHSE? It, it, that's, that's a very good question, Jamie. A, a lot of this is, is to do with scale. So obviously, um, Herefordshire is a smaller county. Um, Hereford County Hospital is a smaller a hospital. So you know, even if um, challenges with with acute and urgent care flow are proportionally similar, the overall impact is is less. So you know, twenty ambulances outside um, Worcester Royal, um, maybe five ambulances outside Y Valley. Um, at, the, at the Herefordshire County Hospital. So, 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 so I think that's the reason it gets different attention. In terms of system focus, though, um, th there is there is a proportionate focus on on um, Herefordshire urgent care systems. Thank you, Matthew. This, this isn't directly related to the, the operational report, but I think it I just, just wraps it all up together uh, and picks up what, what is on all our minds that we've, um, Mark has sort of asked, has said, yes, congratulations, that we are bucking the trend in terms of meeting our financial commitments. I just want a assurance of the board and public board that we, we are not meeting our financial commitments at the expense of our operational and our safety and our, our, our quality commitments, because that, that is behind all the, you know, every report you read about where errors are, is because the board had too much focus on meeting finance and, and how, are we, how are we actually managing that on an operational level and, and that the, the key uh, clinical and operational teams aren't constrained by an over, uh, undue influence of, of finance. Um, um, Martin, I think I think that's um, the balance is well illustrated by the fact that um, we are using um, staffing numbers um, up to safe staffing levels, despite the increasing reliance on temporary staff on seven of our wards. Seven of our, our wards, in fact, have over fifty percent of. Um, uh, bank and agency staff usage 
um, and on our mental health wards, we don't have um, a defined upper limit on the safe staffing level. So we have an indicative staffing level, but ward managers are able, according to clinical need, to roster additional staffing against clinical need. Thanks, Martin. That, and that's a real fundamental question, actually, across the whole piece, as you as, as you indicated. Um, uh, a couple of points I was going to make, Matthew. Um, urgent community response. Thank you from the board to you, the teams and everybody involved. It is a success, not in the making. It's there. And I believe it's now exceeding what was expected of it when it was originally set up. So it's it's gone beyond optimum performance. Um, and hasn't, if I read, I think, I can't remember which report I read it in, it's not detrimentally affected our response within our community teams either, in terms of our, you know, because I know it's our neighbourhood teams that are doing this. So it's 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 a great success. So um, all credit to you and the teams for doing this, especially now the ambulance are, are starting to uh, more referrals. So so thank you very much. On the same theme, might might be a bit detaily, and I won't mention the name, but you're you're just just about to or have lost a senior member of staff that works in the U, in the um, urgent emergency care for you. In the replacement of that member of staff or reconfiguration, whatever you are going to do, and that's neither here nor there to this meeting, can you give us some reassurance that that's not going to create a sort of a, a down in our performance in any way, please? No, um, we've we've been extraordinarily blessed in this in that we've uh, made a, a, a good and very strong internal appointment who's in fact able to commence in post five days before the incumbent leaves. So there's actually an opportunity there for a handover from one person, one very, very strong performer to somebody else who I think is, is uh, going to bring a new dimension to the role as well. That, that that's great news and not for public consumption but it'd be useful if you could drop us a note as to who's i mean us as in you know the people that aren't very often in these personnel loops and non-execs just to because it's an important post and we we did see that person whenever we talked about urgent uh, and emergency care so it'd be useful to know who's replacing that so I'd be grateful for that matthew thank you very much uh can we note matthew's operational report please and which allows us to move on to a report that has a an assurance level of six, so uh, and and rightly so as well, uh, Rob. So so you you win today, but please, uh, if you could present your report on the estate strategy, please. Yep, thank you, Mark. And um, it's it's really good to be bringing this back. So you'll all remember a year ago when we had the the nice new estate strategy that we discussed and approved at board. We set out actually quite a few big things that we needed to do. Um, Clearly, this focuses on what we've managed to do in the first year and um, the the assurance level, I guess, Mark, I'm doing my CFO half glass empty, of course, is focused on where we are at the moment. There's still some really big things to do with our estate strategy in the coming four years, but uh, good progress so far. So um, clearly the, the key things we were setting out to do um, at this early stage uh, in terms of the big things were really around that estate solution for Redditch, as well as some of the national pieces around dormitories and other things that have come on, which I'll mention. But um, uh, Redditch has actually been a long-standing um, ambition of the board, um, you know, some quite compromised accommodation up at Smallwood House, which we've been trying to uh, come out of for quite some time. And this has moved pretty quickly in the end, actually. We've, um, we've You'll see from the report we've just about completed um, the renovations and some pretty big transformation work on Orchard Place, which the results are absolutely stunning for those of you who visited. It's um, a massive transformation from an old, um, you know, work uh, work uh, uh, rehabilitation kind of space. I'm struggling with the words, um, but it is a massive transformation, um, and we have got to a really good place, not closed yet, but um, working very closely with our um, district council partner up in Redditch to come up with a, a really strong solution for um, relocating those large services of um, you know, CAMs, uh, Healthy Minds out of Smallwood House uh, into um, 
British Town um, Hall, which will be a really good solution. We're hoping to close the details of that out formally by the end of this uh, uh, calendar year with work starting in um, Q1. Um, so those are some of the really big bits, obviously lots of other stuff going on. Um, I'll just mention the um, mental health urgent and emergency care pathway monies that we received. Um, it's involved quite a bit of working with our acute uh, colleagues to work out how we can repatriate the um, um, the space there, but we, we've got an agreement in place for that, so we are confident we will do that, which will bring in some much needed uh, improvements to the crisis space and liaison uh, above the new ED. Um, and then a couple of other bits I just wanted to draw out, um, Mark, which I think talk to some of the, the things that came up earlier. Um, we've, on the back of um, the discussions, the improvement work we've been doing, we are changing the, the emphasis on the, the kind of the planned maintenance of the estate to a more uh, proactive rolling programme informed by place rather than maybe something that was driven by place. So place will be, I describe it as the, you know, the cherry on the top, as it were, um, with a, with a programme. So we're carrying out a, a, um, a programme of work this year around some um, surveys, and then we'll, we intend to have that kind of rolling programme, which we can make visible uh, across the team. So particularly for Matthew, Natalie, and John, so so people are aware where that where that program is. That will still allow us to flex in and, and upgrade where appropriate, but that that's something that we're we're trying to do. Um, and then of course dormitories, which I've touched on, um, got some fabulous new environments coming through. Sarah's talked about Holt, which is which is good. Um, I've mentioned we've got a bit of an issue emerging around uh, the cash flowing on Stonebow in particular, which I'm working hard with. Uh, regional colleagues to try and uh, bottom and unlock, but um, the actual physical environment that are coming out of the dormitories is is fantastic stuff. And those of you here, what three years ago when we uh, we put in for the for the funding and we got it, um, I think we're seeing some really good, fantastic quality environment coming out from the taxpayer, which is going to improve quality of care. Mark, that 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 was it. Uh, happy to take questions. Any questions from anybody, Martin? Yeah, it's just a question with all the, the the building going on, how we're measuring the sustainability of what we're putting in so that our, you know, we've got a good sustainability and social value targets over the five years. And are we, are these helping us incrementally to move towards that? And are they being measured? Because I didn't see it in the report. Um, yes, um, yes. I, I guess that's in. Oh, sorry, a bit of feedback. Um, a lot of that's embedded, Martin, in, in how we go about this. So you're probably aware of some of this, but but for the for the record for everyone else, um, there's some very strong national um, requirements around um, buildings, um, so-called BRIAM um, compliance, which, which makes sure that modern healthcare facilities we build are up to a high value, high standard. The other part that we've got, Martin, which probably brings in some of the social value part, is there's new regulations that come through on procurement, which um, weight the, the scoring of the assessment towards um, taking on board and into account um, that overall social um, benefit and sustainability. So that is included within the, uh, the scoring of any um, contracts we, we let out. And, and then I think, you know, the final one I'd say, uh, we 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 probably haven't shouted about it enough, but I think the the Redditch solution, which is working in partnership with district council there to to you know reutilise renovate space in the middle of Redditch is is a really good example of working partnership, and that that came through our long standing um, good working relationships that uh, Mark Fenton our estates leaders had over many years with with partners. So I think I think there's a lot there, Martin. Thanks, Robert. Uh, Janet. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, I don't often put my dental hat on, but I'm going to now and just say um, how pleased I was to see that you've actually um, put, you know, moved the dental service out of Smallwood House and put it into Orchard Place. And actually, I mean, I know Moore Street was, fanta um, was fantastic a few years ago. This looks equally fantastic. Many trusts don't invest in their dental services. Um, and actually, 
one of the reasons is it's expensive to put dental clinics in and to see that we've replaced one surgery with two surgeries which is much safer and um, much better for patients and um, it's fantastic so I just wanted to say um, on behalf of dental colleagues really thank you very much for doing that um, I'm sure it's incredibly appreciated thank you yeah it, it, if you haven't been Janet it looks fabulous and you know the decontamination space um, it was expensive <laughs> but um, that's part that you know th th this is the dividend of being a financially sustainable trust that we reinvest into services Thank, thank you. And, and the points well made by Janet on dental services, but wherever else we're making these investments, which is across the portfolio. Yes, it's driven by patient experience and patient care. Absolutely. But what it also does, it makes the working environment so much better for our staff. And in the in the very challenging and stressful times that our staff are in at the moment to create better working environments for them is is a real a real blessing to be honest and that's why we're driving on and uh, credit to all your team Robert to, to get to where we are I noticed you said obviously we've got four more years of the plan but year one if the other four years go in accordance with what we've done in year one then then it'll be a, a continuing good news story so thank you very much and please feed that back to to Mark and the team very much appreciate all the work that they do again it's easy it we can take that for granted but trust me, elsewhere, you don't always take these things for granted. Here's a plan. And oh, look, we're delivering it on buildings and capital projects. Um, but, and, and we are here. So thank you. Uh, Natalie, is flu coming? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> um, so, yes, the, the twin demic is expected. Um, and we're starting to see uh, regionally and locally the first, first flu A cases Um are increasing so it is coming so this um is an annual requirement to share with the board and um, ask the board's commitment to support the vaccination program for the autumn winter booster of covid booster vaccine sorry and the flu vaccine for this season so it outlines the plan against the national strategy that we have to confirm that we are committed to um, there is a sequin requirement attached to this related to the flu vaccine, not to the COVID booster, that we are to achieve a minimum of 70. Maximum aim is for a 90 percent uptake of flu vaccine for patient facing staff. So the plan outlines how we are going to try and achieve that um, and is just really asking for board commitment to the programme. Thank you, Natalie. Any, any questions at all? Um, Natalie, uh, oh, sorry, we have Martin. Sorry, Natalie. I, I, I just saw reports that, 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 that there have been issues about giving out the wrong flu vaccine to various age groups. Is that, and it's patchy across the country, is that affected our population or is that elsewhere? No, that, yeah. that, hasn't, that hasn't affected us. Um, and there is always this debate around if you only have a guaranteed supply of a particular vaccine, do you do you take the risk and administer the slightly less effective vaccine to that specific age group? And that is a balance of is that the better vaccine as opposed to no vaccine whilst you're waiting for a supply of the older age vaccine to come in? Right. Okay. Thank you. Janet. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you just a question about the numbers. Um, so in Appendix 1, you talk about last year's um, flu uptake and number of staff who were eligible as support clinical staff was 1541. And this year it's increased to 2219. So I just wondered, are we including more staff within that um, within that definition or have we increased our staffing by that amount? Because um, it's going to make the uptake rates different not comparable yeah. no so this is the end of the vaccine program work where you realign who's in your baseline measurement that you can't do at the start so anybody who's off um for example long-term sick maternity throughout the flu vaccine program you can take out and we can um align certain staff if they aren't patient face facing to come out of that baseline measure I think the clarity this year is most people will, will be patient facing, people walking through our buildings. Um, so we, we are using a that baseline at the moment, but we, we'll review it with the national team. 
Thank you. If there are no other questions, I assume we all approve this paper and the way forward. Thank you very much. I did notice, Natalie, level five by December. It would be nice to be thinking we're into sixes and beyond when we get th when we get through Christmas, um, because I think that that target going by last year of 60 odd percent and we need really to get much higher than that. Um, and I think it's fair to say the general population, let alone our own staff, have probably got a little bit of vaccination fatigue, I guess. We need to try and break through that somehow to ensure they're all as, as protected as possible to protect our patients. Thank you very much. Uh, annual governance statement, six monthly, Jill. Yeah, so this is the six month annual governance statement, which obviously sets out um, in particular focusing on our quality governance arrangements, but more widely addressing corporate governance across the trust. And whilst it's only a requirement to complete uh, an annual governance statement, we do um, undertake a six month review, setting out uh, where we're up to at the six month point. And that's the report that's obviously presented here. Uh, I am conscious it seems to get longer and longer every year. Uh, much of the information um, is in prescribed format and then we have free text. And uh, um, when we come to the uh, the end of year annual governance statement, uh, I think I might try and see if we can uh, reduce the page numbers rather than extend them. But this is really presented for people to reflect on and consider as to whether there's anything else here that um, we haven't included uh, and it's also useful for me when I'm looking at other organisations to review their AGSs to actually just look as to whether they're doing anything different and there's anything that we can steal with pride in terms of trying to improve uh, our own corporate governance. So it's presented for information. If anybody uh, has noticed any uh, either omissions or inaccuracies, if they could let me know um, and obviously I'll look to address those. Thanks, Jill. We're a halfway point. Has anybody got any points they wish to raise? Of course, as we go along, if there's anything, then just please, please pass them to Jill. Jamie. Jill, will the ICB be required to produce a similar one? Um, they don't do it in the same way. Um, I would anticipate that they will be doing a review of effectiveness, which effectively should encompass um, the corporate governance arrangements across the system, uh, but uh, it's not in the same prescribed format. I think it's a useful comment though, because obviously looking at corporate governance across the system is really, really important in the first year of operation as a new organisation, I think it's a really useful process to undertake. So I will pick that up with uh, colleagues in the ICB. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Jill. Can we note that report then for six monthly AGS? Thank you very much indeed, uh, which takes us to now the important matter of our care notes reconnection, uh, which is obviously a, a fundamental issue to us as a board. David. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, we, the report I've presented today really <clears throat> sets out some uh, of the background to the care notes outage that started on the 4th of August. Uh, we did discuss this at October, during October board, um, and we made some um, decisions at that board that were um, pertinent to reconnection, but were dependent on some further information uh, coming from care notes. So the paper, because this is this is now in in public, um, just goes through the background, which again is around the the care notes outage, the impact of Adastra, uh, the impact of the um, NCSC and NHSD being involved in cyber assurance. It outlines the rebuild process, just so that the from a public perspective, people understand what's being undertaken. Uh, it summarises the reconnection assurance summary that we discussed at length um, in October, which is based around four primary documents, um, many of which are nationally assigned. So it's national assurance, 
uh, that's been sought by one advanced uh, who are the system uh, suppliers. Um, it, it again for public consumption, it really highlights the clinical and operational risks that we as a trust have, have uh, identified and uh, to some extent uh, mitigated with uh, internal development called THEA. But clearly there's a residual risk of, uh, from a performance and um, a, a, a clinical aspect as well. So in terms of what's new for from a, uh, an exec and non-exec perspective, the, our team have, have updated all the antivirus systems, but to be fair, that's a normal activity for us. Um, what we have done is we've tested several backups uh, and restores to our secondary data center just to be able to confirm to external sources that we, we've complied with the ask, which is, if you remember, there was an uh, advisement from uh, the NCSC as to what you should do before reconnecting. What we've also determined is that one advanced are undertaking a penetration test, uh, which was new uh, for this cycle. Uh, so that wasn't in the original October discussions, which is a good thing, uh, but we've not yet got the results of that uh, penetration test. So this is an external, external accredited organization trying to break into one advanced in a, a non-combative way um, and again the results of that should be available um, this week um, into next week probably now. Um, one of the key questions that was raised by Julie one of our, uh, our non-exec uh, and something that we've we've raised with one advanced is if such an activity happened again, what would be different about the restoration capability? So if you recall, one advanced have got a primary and a secondary data center, but when the um, disaster struck, when the, the attack happened, they shut everything down. Uh, they then uh, were um, restoring Adastra services first due to national guidance. And as part of that national guidance, they had to go through an assurance process, which effectively almost parked our restoration. So, so the questions that Julie and I have raised are really around what's different, what's going to be different. Yes, there might be an outage of, you know, at worst case a day, uh, whilst systems are, you know, verified as being free from any attack, but the, the issue for us is uh, we would expect to see the system coming back in a rapid um, time scale, much more rapid than three months. So um, we're still uh, batting that one back and forth to one advanced. Um, and obviously that was a key question that we needed answering alongside the Mandiant report, which is simply a report that sits against our environment so one advance to building everybody's servers and systems uh in 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 this period and then they run the mandiant report to give us assurance that there's nothing untoward um seen um so so i guess we're not quite where we wanted to be for this board meeting so the the ask really of board is to delegate responsibility for the final uh, reconnection event to the CEO and chair supported by board members effectively uh, CIO myself and 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 John from a clinical perspective um, it just just in terms of uh, the reconnection potential um, of the five trusts that have been reconnected none are live yet so this started 7th of October so there's there's some performance issues and some testing issues that are resulting in, um, you know, delays to that absolute reconnection of live users, which we we need to factor into our communications to the wider team. And, and obviously Gold are, are considering that, Gold Command are considering that pretty much um, on a weekly basis. So, uh, Julie, sorry, got a question there. 
<laughs> Sorry, um, it's it's a combination, David, um, and and you know just to assure everybody, David and I have stayed very close over this, um, and you know we have been really pushing. There are some concerns on my side about particularly the backup thing. Um, they are still referencing that, as far as they're concerned, it's the SLAs that already agree in the contract, or they've already failed that once. So for me, their answer that they will bring the backup in within the contract SLAs is not satisfactory because it's got to move on um, because there is absolutely nothing in their responses that is telling me that they are going to confidently separate their systems out and be able to bring back up. So one of the things David and I have done is agreed um, a risk model we're going to put together for the CEO, the chair and medical team of things we think you need to assess if this decision is delegated to you so that we have got real clarity on some of the big issues. We know it's got to happen. It is holding us all back. Um, and there are things that I'm confident about, but I'm going to flag that is the one thing. And Jill, we may need to take some action on the contract side to push back on that SLA statement that if backup doesn't come up, within that sin. It just isn't acceptable as far as I'm concerned. So I'm happy to recommend that we do delegate because we can't keep waiting to come back to board to be able to switch this on. But I would like everybody to understand David and I have agreed that we're going to put a proper risk model together that we will present to those executives so that they can have in intelligent information to be able to make those um, statements. And I'd like to go on to record to say thank you to David and his team. What they've done with Theo, how they've managed to keep us going has been absolutely awesome. And I just want to put that on record, please. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Julie. And uh, that can only be echoed as well, David, for what you continue to do. And, and you've kept uh, board well updated as we've moved from, was it August the 4th, I think I heard earlier on from Sarah, to where we are today. We've all been kept updated. So uh, has anybody got any further questions? So the ask is that um, a decision on switch back on or not is delegated to Sarah and I, supported by CEO and medical as appropriate. I, I can assure you I will be supported by Julie as well in that. Uh, I, I think it'll be a combination, you know, David, Julie, and the clinical people to tell us what they think. And I, I, I'm sure Sarah and I will be um, happy to do it on that basis. But it, it, those experts will be the ones that uh, that will be advising us. Is everybody comfortable with approving that as set out? Yes, yeah. Mark. OK, thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you everybody. And, and, and thank you, David. Thank you, Julie. And uh, keep on going and keep, keep the foot on the pressure and if it needs to go if it needs to go on the neck on occasions then then do so actually because we we can't we can't get this wrong can we okay that brings us through to some of the admin at the end of the meeting there are two um documents that have been have been sealed or agreed for us to sign and seal and they are do you need to say anything about those jill so um both of these actually relate to a legacy um, that the trust charity has received. Um, we have received a, a share of uh, a legacy following somebody's death. And as part of the uh, legacy, uh, there's some land that's being sold and there's overage deeds which have been completed in respect of the land. So effectively what that means is that this land has development potential and if after it's been sold within a defined period, the land is then uh, becomes much more valuable because planning permission is obtained and it's subsequently resold, um, that then we effectively get um, a, a further payment that's uh, in respect of uh, the the two uh, lots of land. So um, the charity charity is already receiving a payment now. Um, which relates to just the winding up of the estate and there's potential for a further payment in the future. OK, so they can be noted. Thank you, Jill. There have been no AACs in the period. Um, takes us to the board assurance framework. Is there anything we've discussed today that we need to capture in the bath? I have the one thing I did go back and check was the uh, the issue about safer staffing on our community hospital ward. That certainly captured generically within the BAF and specifically within a high uh, high risk um, 
register is is got a specific there so that's that's the thing that stood out to me but we've captured that is there anything else from anybody no okay thank you very much there's a list on your agenda there is a list of reports just uh, three of them uh, available for your consideration should you wish to look at them uh, i haven't been notified of any other business so i'm assuming there is none unless somebody speaks up very quickly now no, thank you. The date of our next meeting is the 11th, public meeting is the 11th of January uh, after Christmas. Good dear me, the year's running away. Um, thank you all at, for attending. I think we had quite a useful meeting uh, today. Thank you for our guests for coming along and our observers. As ever, if any observers have any questions, then I'm sure any of the executives or indeed non-executives, if you have any questions for any of us, then if you contact us, I'm sure we'll be able to answer them. Um, how long do you want for lunch, folks? It's not often I, uh, I, I say that. We are now at uh, five past 12 before we reconvene for our